Hi guys. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the structure of the atom and masses of atoms for reading. So far you should have completed 19.1 and 19.2 which would uh, introduce you to the concepts we're going to be talking about tonight. Make sure you have your composition notebooks out and a pencil ready to go because we're going to be taking notes concurrently as we move through the video. Uh, as we move through, you're going to need to pause the video anytime you see something written in red. So we'll start with this page right here. The title of your notes tonight is going to be Flip Notes on 19.1 and 19.2. And it's Roman numeral number 2, Structure of the Atom. So pause me and make sure to copy that down and do that as we move through the video. Okay, let's go ahead and start with subatomic structure. You can see from uh, the graphics here that sub means to go below. That's the atomic root for going below. And we're going to go below the structure of the atom as Thompson did when he discovered the electron. So let's start with my definition of the atom. The atom is the smallest particle of matter that can be distinguished from other particles of matter. And what that means is that atoms are different in size and shape, just like Democritus said. So if you look below at the two images I have, one is of curium, one is of cobalt, you can see that they're different in terms of their subatomic makeup. They have a different number of electrons, a different number of protons, and a different number of neutrons. But if I look at an electron from cobalt or curium, they're exactly the same. So that's why my atom is the smallest particle of matter that can be distinguished from other particles. Okay, let's move on to my first particle of matter here. We're going to start with my little evil particle. I like to anthropomorphize them to help me remember them. That's my electron. An electron has a negative charge, a relative mass of zero, and it is found outside the nucleus. Relative mass of zero means it does have some mass, because otherwise it wouldn't be matter, but it's so insignificant compared to the mass of the overall atom that we just don't weigh it when we're talking about the mass of the atom. And it is the only particle found outside the nucleus. And I like to remember them being evil as um, they're negative in charge. Okay, let's move on to my happy particle here. Totally pro is my proton. Positive charge has a mass of one and it is found inside the nucleus. I forgot to write our units here, um, and it kind of depends on uh, how we're reading the periodic table, but our mass units for atoms are called AMU, atomic mass units, but you don't have to write that into your notes. Okay, let's move on to my last one. So we've got electrons, protons, and our neutral particle here. Not happy, not sad, because that's our neutron. No charge, mass of one, just like our proton, and it's found inside the nucleus as well, just like our proton. So neutral, zero energy. So how do we differentiate between these atoms on the periodic table? So all of these particles come together to make unique elements, such as xenon, mercury, sodium, oxygen. How do we know which one's mercury, which one's xenon, which one's oxygen? Well, you can see from these squares right here that we abbreviate them using what's called a chemical symbol and that tells us what element is being abbreviated. And our rules for the chemical symbol are that the first letter is always capital, and if there's just a first letter, like with my oxygen over here, it's just a capital. If there's a second letter, that is always lowercase, and it's really important that you guys follow these rules, especially as we start to learn about bonding and writing chemical formulas for compounds. The two that you wanna write down as our examples here are oxygen for O, and sodium is Na, and we're going to come back to this one in a minute. You're going to see sodium a lot. As you guys know, sodium's in salt, and we do a, lot of, uh, do a lot of stuff with salt in chemistry. So make sure you guys remember that sodium is Na. Okay, moving on to masses of atoms. So this should actually be Roman numeral number three. It's a typo I forgot to fix. Sorry about that. Atomic mass and isotopes. So again, make sure you've read 19.2 before watching this part of the video because it'll be a lot easier to understand if you have just a little preliminary knowledge of the vocabulary and concepts we're talking about. Okay, I'm going to start off with four formulas that you want to memorize. Let me talk through them and then you guys can copy them down and put them in the big red box. Number of protons is equal to my atomic number. So if you look in your periodic table in the back cover of your textbook, 
you're going to see a square for every element. And in that upper right hand corner is my atomic number. That's also the number of protons. My number of electrons is the same as my number of protons. So atomic number, number of electrons equals number of protons. Now this is only in a neutral atom. Right now, all atoms are neutral as far as you know. So it doesn't change yet. So um, we'll get into non-neutral atoms when we start to talk about bonding. So for right now, protons, electrons, and my atomic number are all equal. Next one is my protons and my neutrons equal my atomic mass. So if you look in your notes, you'll see that both the protons and the neutrons have a mass of one. My electrons have a mass of zero. So when we're trying to figure out how much mass the atom has, we just add up our protons and neutrons, which we know both are present in the nucleus of the atom. So you just have to count the particles. And now if I rearrange this third problem, I get my number of neutrons is equal to my mass number minus my atomic number. Now again, these four formulas are really, really important that you guys memorize. So put them in a big red box, doesn't have to be red, but put them in a big box and make sure to write down, memorize underneath them because that's a little note to yourself that you have got to get these memorized. You're going to have a quiz coming up in a class or two and you want to make sure you know these for the quiz. Okay, let's do a little bit of practice with them. If you haven't opened up your periodic table, go ahead and open it up uh, just to become familiar with it. We're going to be filling in a grid here. Most of the information you can get from the grid itself using those four formulas, which are now down at the bottom of the page, but you should have them copied into your composition notebook. Um, so let's start up at the top with boron. So here's all the information we know about boron and we're trying to figure out how many protons it has. So which formula tells me the number of protons? Now it might be backwards, this one isn't, but my number of protons equals my atomic number, and I tell you the atomic number right here, but if you look at the square of boron, you'll see that the answer is five. Okay, moving on to carbon. We've got my atomic number, we've got my protons, and now I wanna figure out how many neutrons there are. So I'm going to go down to my number of neutrons equals mass number minus atomic number. And if I look at my carbon square here, it doesn't really tell me anything that I didn't know already. I get my answer is 6. 12 minus 6 is 6. Okay, let's move on to oxygen. My atomic number is going to be equal to my number of protons. So right here I've got 8 protons, which means my atomic number is 8. Now to figure out my mass number, we're going to take this formula right here. Uh, my mass number is equal to my protons and my neutrons. My son's watching the video now. <laughs> so I'm going to add up both my protons and my neutrons, and I get 16. Okay, now let's move on to sodium. Remember I told you to memorize that symbol? Sodium symbol is anybody? 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 Nice, Finn. Finn got it. I hope you guys did. N-A. Okay, let's look at protons now. So my atomic number is equal to my number of protons. Bam. How about copper? Copper is kind of a tricky one. It comes from the Latin word for copper. So it's not C-O. It's actually C-U. My atomic number, 29. And my mass number, 63. Okay, let's move on to what an isotope is. So in your notes, go ahead and add my definition of an isotope, which are atoms of the same element with a different number of neutrons. So everything else about them is the same, number of electrons, number of protons. They're just different because of the number of neutrons. So if we look at these three isotopes of hydrogen, these are the three only isotopes of hydrogen, We've got protium, deuterium, and tritium. We also call them H1, H2, and H3. And if you connect the numbers here, one to one particle, two to two, two, two particles, and three to my three particles right here, you could probably figure out that those numbers right there represent my mass. Now, when I... I try to get it. Now, when I reveal to you what the particles in each of these nuclei look like, We've got one proton in the first one, one proton in the second one, but now we've added a neutron, and then one proton in the third one, and now we've added two neutrons. So they're all the same, 
other than their number of neutrons, right? Protons are the same, electrons are the same, but this one has no neutrons, this one has one, and this one has two. And there are my three nuclei to look back at. Okay, for isotope notation, there's a couple different ways we write down isotopes. One way is by writing the name of the element, chlorine, or you can use its abbreviation, and then you'd write a dash, and you write the mass number right there. Or you can write it this way, seen on the right side of the page. You can write CL. You write the mass number on top as a um, superscript, and then the atomic number below it as a subscript. Now, even though that's not in red, make sure to get both of these two methods down into your notes because they're going to be helpful for you to look at. Okay, last but not least, what's the difference between mass number versus average atomic mass? Well, you guys have been looking at your periodic table, and we've been, term be been determining the masses of these atoms of elements, um, but none of them match the one you see on your periodic table because that's what we call an average atomic mass. So my definition of average atomic mass is the weighted average mass of all the isotopes of an element. So it's kind of like an average mass. It doesn't represent one carbon atom. It represents all of them averaged together. So if you think of figuring out what the average mass of all humans is, that might not be your mass, but it's going to be the average mass of all humans combined that somebody figured out probably using um, a select data set and then extrapolating out. So that's what we do with atoms. Let me give you another example to help you understand this. When we talk about um, children per household in the U.S., the average is actually 2.6 children per household. But we know that you can't have 0.6 kids, right? because that would just be kind of weird and gross, right? You only have whole kids. That's just gross, I know. I'm just making sure you're still awake there. Um, when you look at that 0.6, if we go back and we look at that 0.6, we know that just means it's an average. There's no actual household with 0.6 kids in it. That's just an average of all of the households that exist. So now if we go and we look at my carbon again, if I look in the periodic table, I see that my average atomic mass of carbon is 12.011. Well, what does the mass of an atom come from? It comes from, if you look at your formulas that you have to memorize, comes from number of neutrons and number of protons. So if this weren't an average, it would mean that there was only part of a neutron or a proton here, and that's just not possible. You can only have whole prot protons or whole neutrons in an atom. So if we look closely at carbon, you'll see that carbon exists in nature in three forms. Carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Now the most abundant is carbon-12. We find that 98.9% .9 of the time. Carbon-13 and carbon-14 are much less abundant. So when we find the average, the weighted average of all the carbon isotopes that exist, it ends up being just a little over 12 because there are some 13 and 14 that pull the overall average up. But whenever we're trying to count particles of atoms in an isotope, I will always tell you what the mass of that isotope is, either by noting it using my isotopic notation or telling you the number of protons and neutrons and having you determine the mass. Hope you guys learned a little something. Bring your notes to class and be ready to practice. See you guys soon.